Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to be here to talk about that topic I'm really passionate about, web performance testing and how to integrate it into web development process. My name is Estela, and I am a web performance specialist at Schneider Electric, a French company, by the way, but I can only say bonjour in French, so <laughs> shame on me. And before we start, let me make an important statement. You will see that my talk is about Lighthouse and lab data. But keep in mind that lab data and Lighthouse results may or may not correlate with your real user experiences. So please don't use Lighthouse or lab data like a check uh, to ensure that you will have good Crocs results. Okay, this talk is about different story. We will use that in a different way. That said, let me um, describe a common scenario. Uh, imagine that you and your team has, have spent countless hours working on your new web application, your new feature, your new landing page, and once you deploy it, you start receiving complaints about the slow load times or unresponsive interfaces. And that may cause bad user experience, but that can also even damage your business results, as we've seen in different talks before, and also uh, in bounce rates and different business metrics. So even your, your brand reputation, like the worst scenario that can happen, right? And generally speaking, this is because of the usual process of, a developing a web, of developing a website. Generally speaking, we have different phases. We have a definition phase where all the different requirements are defined. Then we have a development phase where the developers, the developer teams implement the proper code to make things happen. Then during this process of after or after this process, we have a testing phase where we used to have unit tests, component tests, integration tests. And if these tests are successful, we can ship this code, we can deploy this code. And depending on the team, depending on the company, we may have some web performance checks after all this process. And who is responsible for checking this? In my experience, it depends a lot on the company, on the team, or even on the project, because in some cases we may have developers testing web performance, or people from QA, or people from SEO, or from product, or even users through online service. And in the worst scenario, no one is taking care of this, which makes me really sad. And let me explain that with a real example based on my own experience that I had in the past. When the Core Web Vitals were announced uh, several years ago now, I was managing the SEO for a Spanish company. And then I was really happy. I started running Lighthouse tests on a regular basis to ensure that our lab data, again, we know that it's lab data, but to ensure that our code was stable, that our results were stable under that lab scenario. And everything looks good. I mean, we were using at the time a static site generator with a CDN on top of that. So it was quite easy to have good results, to be honest. But then um, the, la the next time that I ran the test, I observed um, some degradation. Actually, this is um, desktop degradation. The mobile degradation was quite worse, but I don't want to make you cry. I already cried. And after regaining my dignity, I tried to figure out what happened. And actually, we had a new hero image. At that time, we just launched a TV campaign, and we had to adapt our look and feel of the, home, of the website to adapt it to the new TV campaign. So we replaced our kind of well-optimized hero image in our homepage by a seven megabytes image. That's true story, <laughs> OK? And nobody noticed that. We had the requirements. We had the image from the designer team and uh, the development team push it to production, and that's it. Uh, the good news is that it was a really easy to fix issue because we just had to optimize the image. Actually, it was even lighter than the previous image that we used to have and push it to production. And since I observed the degradation until we pushed the, the new image to production, it was a matter of minutes. So that was like the, the best scenario in the worst scenario, right? But that's not always the case, right? Because Depending on many things, depending on the complexity of the solution, uh, depending on the impact and the degradation, depending on other priorities that the team may have, uh, depending on many, many variables, this check can be fixed really easy, as the example that I showed you. But in other scenarios, the fix will be moved to the backlog. 
and we don't really know when this will be prioritized and fixed, right? And this has some side effects because we will spend more time working on something that was already done and we know that time is money, Sammy also knows that, and that will cause a bad user experience, may or may not, because again, we are talking about lab data, but I can, tr trust me, seven megabytes will impact, especially on, mo on mobile users. Um, so your users may have a bad experience during all the time that we have this issue in production. Not only that, we will also have a bad developer experience, because we will have developers working twice on something that was validated. We had some tests, right, and everything was good. So it caused some um, friction sometimes with developers. So to overcome this situation, my suggestion, the best practice that we can apply, is to add web performance testing to our existing testing phase. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting to stop uh, checking performance in production. Actually, I'm a huge fan of doing this because, generally speaking, the um, production environments are quite different from other pre-production or lower environments. So this is like a um, double check that it's interesting to do to ensure that we don't have any interpretation or even we have improvements if we are expecting some improvements, right? And when I suggest this, one of the first comments that I get is like, but Stella, don't worry. We already run Lighthouse tests locally in our machines during the development process. Local machines. I have mixed feelings here. Because on one hand, this is good. I mean, this can help to identify some potential issues during the development process, right? And this can also help a lot to improve the web performance culture. Because we will have developers being aware of this topic, being aware of some metrics that they should ensure that they are okay based on different thresholds, right? But we're talking about manual work. And that's really hard to ensure that we can apply like some kind of standard rules to test that uh, because we are not sure of how many URLs are the people testing and how many runs and are they testing a desktop or mobile or what are their conditions, right? Because depending on every developer machine and conditions and so on, I mean, every local environment can be a totally different environment. So we don't have any stable standard environment. And if you rely on this kind of testing, what may happen? That you have some new code pushed to production that is causing degradation. And when, when you ask why this happened, you were testing, right? And it's like, yeah, it worked on my machine. And we don't want to get that answer, right? So my recommendation uh, to avoid this is to apply web performance testing in continuous integration. And before moving on, uh, let me introduce some topics to ensure that everyone has the proper context. <coughs> Let's uh, start with Git. Git is a free and open source distributed version control system that you can use from very small personal projects up to very complex corporate ones. Then we have GitHub. GitHub is a Git repository uh, hosting service that um, brings Git features plus its own features. And one of them is, ta-da, continuous integration. So you can run um, CI in GitHub with GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions is a tool built into GitHub that uh, allows you to automate tasks. So you can think about this like an assistant handling repetitive tasks so developers can focus on creating and improving code. And now that these topics are introduced, I'm ready to introduce you to the next topic. Lighthouse CI. This is the core of this presentation. Uh, Lighthouse CI, or LHCI, uh, is a suite of tools that makes continuously running, saving, retrieving, and asserting against uh, Lighthouse results smooth and easy. And to use that in your GitHub repository, you need first to install the Lighthouse CI app. Uh, there's a link in the presentation to uh, the app um, stuff, so you can configure it and you can install it um, in all your repositories or only the selected ones. Once you configure that, GitHub will give you a token that you need to uh, keep it in a good place because this is the only time that <laughs> you, will sh you will see it. And then with this token, we can now configure our repository, our website, our code to use that. And this is a GitHub repository. And then we have the settings tab. Here we have the secrets, actions. We can create a new repository secret. 
And here we will put our token that we got from Lighthouse CI um, application. So let me guide you through all the process. Um, this is generally speaking a sample repository. So to set up your Lighthouse CI configuration stuff, your, your workflow in this case, to be executed by GitHub Actions, you must uh, add your workflows under GitHub workflows folder. So that GitHub will find them. And let's see how a file like this looks like. They, they must be YAML files, okay? So here's a basic example. Uh, you can see here that we will run this workflow. We have two different triggers. Whenever we push any code to specific branches in this example, uh, when I push something to the main or to the development branch, I will trigger this stuff. Or uh, whenever I open a pull request to the main branch. And then we have the stuff that we're going to run. Here we have uh, some configuration stuff because we will run Lighthouse CI on an Ubuntu machine. It will use these actions in order to be able to be executed in with this node version. And then we have the run commands that we want to execute. Um, so here we have the NPL, NPM installed to install the dependencies, and we also install the LHCI CLI, it's quite complicated to say that, um, to have the proper LHCI commands. Then we build the application with the um, NPM run build, and then we have the LHCI out run, and finally we have here our variable uh, of the um, Lighthouse token. And then when we have this in place, this execution will look for a specific configuration file to understand what needs to be checked, right? And by default, this Lighthouse CI stuff is able to identify any configuration file called Lighthouse RC or that Lighthouse RC, JavaScript, JSON, or YAML file. And let's, if you, you, you can use other names, but you need to uh, inform them in the YAML file then, okay? Then let's look uh, at the configuration file. Um, you can customize five different things. Here you have a link to the documentation with all the different options because uh, we would need several hours to go through all of them. But let's see a basic example to see how it works. Uh, you can see here an example. It's very basic. You can see here that I'm uh, describing the URLs that I want to test. You can see that I'm using localhost. I'm not using actual URLs because if not, I will be testing production, right? If I put my example.com URL, Lighthouse will, will be run over that production URL. I'm starting the server with npm, npm start. Again, that depends on your repository and how you start your application. And the port, again, it depends on your project. If your project is by default running on port uh, 3001, you need to modify that to, to adapt it to your project. And then here we have the assertions, what we want to check, right? This is a very basic example. I'm just checking the performance score. I want to make sure that it's at least 80. And if it's uh, less than 80, we will have a warning. And then, um, because this is running Lighthouse, right? So I want to upload the outcome of the Lighthouse execution to a temporary public storage. So we will have a URL available for a few days to check the actual um, report. So let's see this in action. I created a very basic Next repository to check these things and show it to you. So you can see here when I pushed some code, in this case to my development branch, we can see here in the Actions tab, I can see here all the workflows that are executed. And here you can see it's a still work in progress when I took this screenshot. And we have here the description of the comment that I did. And when it's finished, or even if it's still run running, you can go inside it and see all the details, all the steps that are done uh, through this workflow. And you can see here, by default, uh, Lighthouse will execute three runs per URL, but you can configure that in your configuration file. In this case, just one URL, because I just put the localhost 3000 here. And then we have here uh, the, um, the temporary public storage link. And if we open that, we can see here, OK, that looks good, right? And you, you also have here the three dots. So you can download the HTML file or the JSON file. So you are able to have this um, Lighthouse report if you want to store it larger than that instead of just having that in the temporary public storage. And what may happen when we have uh, degradation? And actually, I added a heavy background image to one of the elements just to force to have worse results. And here we have in green 
that the workflow was executed successfully. And when we check the details, here we can see that one of the, well, the only assertion that we had in, in our file is not failing because it's just a warning. You can see that weighted triangle for the warning stuff. Uh, we were expecting at least 80, but the results showed 75, right? And if we open the report, we can see here, yeah, the performance report shows the performance score is 75, but if you look at the LCP, it's terrible, like, right? Because <coughs> uh, we used to have like two seconds, and now it's like uh, 10 seconds uh, slower. So that's not really helpful, right? Because you need to click a lot of things to be able to identify if we have any warning. <coughs> so to make it easier for everyone to understand if we have any issues, it's really important to understand and use web performance budgets. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because actually we have Tammy here who has made an amazing work over the last few years talking about this topic. So you can directly check out her talks about this topic and learn about that. Uh, but to try to sum up part of this, it's really important to set your assertions keeping in mind your current scores. Because it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to put uh, an LCP of 2.5 seconds when your application's LCP is 12 seconds right? It will always fail. And what is worse? I mean, first, it's failing. Yeah, it's always failing. I don't care. And what happens? In, instead of 12, now maybe we have 15. And you haven't noticed that because it's, yeah, it's failing. It's always failing. So that, that's why it's really important to set your assertions based on your current scores, even if you are failing, the, let's say, the, the good uh, thresholds for these metrics. So I modified this file to put here some uh, assertions based on the initial results of my dumb next application. So in this case, I'm being a more aggressive, so I want to make sure that the performance score is 90 or larger than that. And then I have here some assertions for the FCP, LCP, CLS, and TBT, again, based on the initial results that I have. And I'm, again, I'm just checking the same that I had on Lighthouse because, again, I'm not trying to ensure that I have good cracks results. I'm trying to ensure that my web application doesn't suffer any regression when I push new code to production, right? So it's like to check that maybe, maybe something that we implemented is causing any side effects that we weren't aware. Or the opposite, if we are working on improving web performance, I want to also check that to make sure that I can keep improving my results. So uh, now that we've seen this, and also I'm putting errors, not warnings anymore, right? Because now when I push more code to my application, now it's red, it's not green, right? So now if I check the actions, I can see that, whoa, something failed. So it's easier to you to understand that you need to check what failed, right? And if I click it, I can see that two of the assertions were failing, uh, this performance score and also the LCP. And in this case, you can see, yeah, the LCP is quite bad now, right? I was expecting something good. I used to have something good, and now it's really bad. And if we want to open a pull request to merge this code into production, um, we had a trigger as well when we open a pull request to the main branch, it will also execute this stuff. So you can see here that it's failing. And depending on how the repository is configured, this can even block the merge functionality. So you can prevent pushing this code to production, again, depending on the project and how it's configured, and probably you need to discuss this with other people in the team. But I mean, uh, the possibility is here. And that looks good. I mean, this is something that you can easily see during the development process. That, oh, it's like, like other tests that we may have in our process, right? Something is failing. Oh, I need to take care of that. But if you want to walk the extra mile, I would recommend you to use Lighthouse CI server because it saves historical Lighthouse data. Uh, you will have trends in a dashboard and interactive dashboard, so you can go deeper to understand the differences between builds. And to use that, you, ca you can integrate that into your own uh, architecture because the only requirements are that you should have a um, node and uh, database storage. So uh, here you have a link to the documentation about how to properly configure that. Um, you can, again, you can put that in your own architecture or you can use a cloud solution, um, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Heroku. There are different options that you can use in the market. 
uh, or instead of configuring it from scratch, you can also use a Docker image. Uh, there's this image that you can use as well. Uh, so it's like everything is in place. You just need to make sure that you deploy this image in your uh, server. And once you have this installed, you can run in your new Lighthouse CI server the wizard. This will guide you through a process to configure different things and to connect it to your GitHub project. And it will give you two tokens, one build token that we will use it to add data to this Lighthouse CI server, and the admin token, keep it secret this. And then with this build token, we are able to configure the Lighthouse um, configuration file that we saw before. Here we can see that instead of having the temporary public storage, we are targeting, uh, we have the server base URL and the build token. Keep the secrets as well, uh, even the base URL. Keep in mind this is also important. By default, this Lighthouse CI server solution doesn't offer you any kind of uh, authentication. Okay, so you need to configure it that, and that's why I don't like to use visible URLs in any repository, okay? And here you have some screenshots about how it looks like. Uh, here you can see that I had like two builds failing, well not failing, it's, it's a performance score, right? So it's not that good. Then with the background image. Then I removed the background image, it's getting better. And then I added an IMG tag, it's getting worse. Not only that, because that's just the performance score, right? Here, uh, well, also important, you can check the different URLs that, do, that you are monitoring, you are checking with this um, Lighthouse CI stuff, and the branches, because depending on your configuration, you will have different branches here to check the different data. And we also have uh, the metrics uh, dashboard, where we can see the evolution, all of them are quite stable, stable, but we can see here the LCB, when we have that heavy image, and when we don't have that heavy image, and this is interactive. If you hover that, you will have more information. And you can see here that you have links to the report itself, the Lighthouse report, and also to the CI div, where we can see the differences between builds. For example, here, when we observed the last degradation for that category, the, the different category scores, and then we have the different metrics, all these things are interactive. When you click somewhere, you will have more information. For example, for the LCP, you can see here, we have the current LCP, which is actually an IMG tag. And the previous one was a text node. You can see it. And um, because just seeing a screenshot is quite weird, uh, let me show that uh, with a local repository that I have. Let me see. I can see anything. This is the LHCI server. Uh, if you have different projects, you will have here the list of the different projects. And then here you have the trend that I told you with the different ups and downs, depending on the different things that you are deploying. Uh, again, here you have the URLs that you are checking, the development. In this case, I just have one URL for the development. Uh, here you have the trend for the metrics. And as I was mentioning, here we have interactive stuff. So we can see uh, the report itself or the, or the div. Here you can see, you need to check the base, which is the previous one. Uh, this one, not this one. Ah, sorry. I don't see it here. You can see uh, the degradation of the different categories, and then, as I mentioned, everything is here uh, interactive. You have a lot of information, um, so you are able to deeper investigate what caused the degradation to any of these metrics, right? So, uh, 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 where do I have this? Now. Wait. Sorry, I'm not mirroring the screen, so I'm not able to see it. Yeah. So you've seen that in action, because just with a screenshot, it's quite complicated to see how interactive it is. Um, to, to interact with that. And then uh, the next question that I may have, or maybe you are wondering, is like, oh, but Estela, we don't, we don't use GitHub at all. Or we have complex projects, and it's not just an, a JavaScript uh, front-end repository that I, I can run and have pages available to test locally, right, uh, in GitHub. How can we apply web performance testing? And that's a really good question. Uh, but the answer is, it depends. 
because it depends a lot on your application, on your um, resources, on how you want to manage that. I mean, you can build your own uh, system based on um, different tools or you can use different commercial tools that directly allow you to have a UI. In this case, probably you need to whitelist your pre-production environment um, IPs or ensure that the user agent of the tool is uh, able to access your pre-production environments because in this case we will be able to we are not testing locally in a repository we want to test a pre-production environment url and most of the times at least the best practice is to ensure that they are not publicly accessible so depending on how you want to manage that you have different ways to do that um, but i mean it's not impossible but it's harder okay and then um, to wrap up, uh, key takeaways of this session that I hope you get with you. Uh, web performance testing helps prevent degradation in your development, in your deployment to production. Again, we are not just checking that our core web vitals will be good. We are just checking that our code is not suffering degradation in terms of web performance. Uh, it will reduce the time spent troubleshooting on noticed web performance issues. And we will also improve developer experience because we won't have that um, back and forth uh, working again on something that, that was already done and validated in the past. Um, you can integrate web performance testing into your web, de web development process with LHCI. And LHCI server is a great option to help you visualize trends and identify potential problems with, uh, when degradation is observed. So that's all that I have for today. And I don't know if we have time for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so from my experience, Lighthouse scores, at least when you run, them, run it locally, can be a bit inconsistent. And also from experience, when you have some inconsistent in checks in your CI, can be like quite a bad developer experience because uh, sometimes you know the check fails randomly. You relaunch the CI and it works. So developers often like ignore this check, so they work around them. So I don't know. Is it more consistent when you run it with Lighthouse CI? Maybe because it's a more consistent environment. Or like how have you dealt with uh, maybe inconsistency and people ignoring the check because it is a bit mm. flaky. In my experience, it's quite uh, stable. And actually, you uh, can configure how many runs per URL you want to check. So that's why I also encourage you to run several checks, not just one. Um, and the report that is uh, finally uploaded somewhere is the median one. So at least you may, if you run several ones, you are ensuring that you're at least getting not extremes, not outliers, uh, to try to balance the, the results. But in my experience, it's more stable than running locally. Because locally, it's like crazy, to be honest. You run it, and just one minute later, run it again, and it's like completely different story, right? So in my experience, at least here, um, they tend to be more stable. But it can also depend on your um, staff, because if you have different dependencies for your repository that they are quite unstable, that will impact also your loading process. Okay. Thank you. I think we can uh, take one other question, quick. Is there one? No? So thank you, Estela. Thank you.